Welcome back to Moby C Control Cabinet Products Basic to Intermediate Training. This is Session 8 and Lab Number 2. I am sure you are more than ready to start spinning the motor. You're tired of learning about just background information. Yes, we dipped in the Moby Suite last time, but I'm sure you're ready to make things move. Well, it's about time. Let's do it. We're going to do a basic motor startup and we're going to explore manual mode. We have just a few pre-lab instructions and then we'll dive in. First of all, I want to have a brief word about motors before we start. You may remember when I introduced this class that I said ideally you should have both an asynchronous motor and a servo motor for this class. That's because some labs work better with one or the other and some only work with one or the other. I also said you needed to have a feedback device like an encoder or a resolver on the motor because some labs require it. So hopefully you have both, but it's possible you only have one. Now, if possible, if you have it, please use an asynchronous motor for this lab. It was really designed for an asynchronous motor where we're not going to use any feedback. It is possible to make it work without one using a servo motor, but you'll get a better experience if you've got an asynchronous motor like the one shown here. However, recognizing that you may not have one and may have just a servo motor, I have created two sets of lab instructions and link them both in the description section. So be sure you match the instructions to what you've actually got, otherwise it's going to get very confusing. I will do this for any lab where there is a difference between a servo and an asynchronous motor. And if it's not possible to use one in a lab, I will let you know. There are a few. I'll be following the instructions for the asynchronous motor because that's really what this lab was designed to explore. So that's what you'll be seeing. I won't be talking about servo motors when I do the walkthrough. Now, another comment totally unrelated to motors. It's a topic you may bump into throughout this entire class. I'm going to introduce it now. You won't necessarily see it when you do this lab, but it's possible you will. So let's get it out of the way. It's what I call when your world gets out of sync. Sometimes the project, which is stored in Movi Suite, and what's in the VFD itself isn't synchronized. In other words, the VFD may have some settings in it that are not reflected in the project, or the project itself may have settings that aren't in the VFD. This can happen easily. So when this happens, obviously you've got to correct it because you want your project and your VFD to be saying the same thing, so you're confident that everything is in sync. And I'll just add an extra note here that loading a project doesn't automatically update the access necessarily. There are times when a project is loaded into Movie Suite, but it is not propagated into the VFD. The VFD settings are whatever it was before. So how do you know when the situation exists and how do you deal with it? Well, happily, Movie Suite's pretty intelligent about it and lets you know. How do you know when you're not in sync? Very simple. You're going to see this on the access circle. It's a symbol that appears. So when the access and the project are not in sync, you'll see this little notification symbol. It's a yellow triangle with a not equal sign in it in the upper section of the access circle. When that happens, it means that Movi Suite has detected that what it's got in its project and what's in the access don't match. And if you click that little symbol, this dialog box will pop up and say data set difference. In other words, something doesn't match. And this gives you the opportunity to resynchronize the project and the access to make them match. Now, here's where it gets complicated. There are two ways you can do this and the outcomes are different. And so I want to explain the difference so you know what you're looking at and which button to click. So which way should you synchronize, in other words, from the project to the VFD or the VFD to the project? Well, let me explain the differences first. All right, let's say that you see this data set different. You've popped it up by clicking the little symbol on the access circle, so you know there's a mismatch. If you select the first button, PC to device, what it's going to do is copy what's in Movi Suite, what's in the project, in other words, into the access, overwriting whatever is in the access. 
So if your project is the thing that really needs to be dominant, then click PC to device. It will overwrite whatever's in the access and then everything will be in sync. That little symbol will go away and you can move on with your life. Do this when you've loaded a project from your local hard drive and it doesn't match what's in the access. In other words, you want a loaded project to override the access. This, by the way, is how you use a stored backup and load it into the VFD. You load that stored backup from your archived copy into the project. The symbol comes up and then you sync it into the VFD and that moves the backup into the VFD. So this is one occasion when you would sync PC to device. However, you can sync the other way. You've got another button choice, device to PC. What happens when you click that? If you do this, it will copy whatever's in the VFD and pull it into the project. Now, if you've started a brand new project, it actually gives you a chance to do this during the time you're starting it up. But maybe you have started a project in some way that it didn't go out there and sync to the VFD, but that symbol appears. You pop up this dialog box, you say device to PC, and it will go out and read the VFD, suck its settings into your project, and overwrite whatever's in the project. This, by the way, is a good way to do a backup of a VFD because it lets you pull what's already in there into your project, then you could save it as a file and archive it. So this is actually a good way to do backups. It's not that obvious it's a backup, but that's really what you're doing. So do this when the access has been changed in some way, or you want to preserve what's in there in a project and then save it to a file. All right, so that's the difference. The compare button, by the way, simply compares the two and identifies the difference. You won't necessarily use that one a lot. It's really the two synchronization direction buttons you'll use. So let me give you a bottom line. How do you decide what you want to do? Because obviously one thing's going to get overwritten. Well, start by asking yourself, what has changed? That's the real question you care about. What has changed? And then ask yourself, what do I want to keep? Make a decision. Is it more important to keep the project intact or the VFD intact? That determines the direction. And once you've decided that, Choose the direction and make it happen by clicking the button. All right, go ahead and pause the video and go do the lab. And then when you're done, come back and I'll do the lab walkthrough. All right, well, I hope that went well and you got your motor spinning and enjoyed playing with manual mode. Let's do the lab walkthrough now, and I'll take you through it, and you can observe it. Remember, I'm using an asynchronous motor, so if you had a synchronous motor, this is a good chance to get a look at how the other way works. So let's go ahead and walk through it. All right, let's do a lab. As you can see, I've got Movi Suite fired up. My demo unit's connected and properly interfaced, and it's turned on, so I'm ready to pick up where we left off at the end of our previous lab. But if you've taken a break, of course, you'll need to set your system up like this, and you'll need to open up the project that we created last time. Now, you can see the project is shown here at the top of the last open projects list. You can just double-click that to go, or you can click the Open button and navigate to wherever you saved it. In my case, a folder called Class on my desktop. I'll just double click it here and open up the project. So there we go, this is our project here. And as you can see, we're on the axis circle. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to reset our VFD to what's called delivery condition. In other words, the condition that comes from the factory out of the box. There are a number of ways to reach that. As I've said many times with Movi Suite, it almost doesn't matter where you click, you can get where you want to go very easily. But I'm going to follow the directions here, which I'm hoping you did too. What I'm going to do is just click the top section of the circle to get to my menus, and then I'm going to pick the basic settings, which is part of the device properties menu group. This allows me to do a number of things, but what I want to do today is reset the drive to factory default. I pick the first submenu, which actually is already picked, reset device parameters, 
and I pick the button Delivery State right at the top. Unlike many previous SCW EuroDrive products, it actually gives you a moment to say, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. With MovieDrive B, our previous flagship product, when you told it to reset, it did it without question. Movi C is a little more thoughtful. So Movi Suite says, do you really want to do this? And I say, yeah, go ahead, let's restore the delivery state. So it's going to reset my VFD back to a clean condition. And it is completed. So now we're done and I'll just go ahead and close the window here. Okay, so now I have successfully reset my VFD. It's back to its factory default condition. And one way you can tell that actually is by looking in the upper corner at the status symbol and it is C4. If you look up C4 in the manual, you'll see it basically means this is an uncommissioned VFD. It hasn't been started up, so it can't run a motor until we go through that process. Let me make a point though, just before we go on and commission our motor, I have factory reset my VFD. And when you're doing this with an individual VFD that you're connected up to directly like I am, that makes a lot of sense. You really only have one thing you can reset. But do be aware, if you are connected to a setup where there are multiple VFDs visible, that's usually on a controller-based MoviDrive, like MoviDrive System or MoviDrive Modular, when you reset one VFD or one access module, it doesn't touch the others. Every single Movi C device is factory reset individually. So if you want to reset a big, complicated system with a bunch of axes, you're going to have to do it one by one. You can't just issue a reset every single thing you can see command because it doesn't exist. Okay, time to move on. What we're going to do now is commission the VFD so it can run a motor. I have attached an asynchronous motor up to my drive. It does have an encoder. I've plugged the encoder cable in. Remember, you are supposed to have an encoder-based motor of some kind. We're not actually going to use the encoder for our first lab, but I do want to have it actually connected. We're now going to go ahead and commission our drive. What I need to do first, though, is I need to look at the motor nameplate to obtain its basic nomenclature and its electrical parameters. I've looked at the physical nameplate on my motor, which is an SEW motor in this case. It's a DRN80 motor, and I've identified several things. First of all, I have a motor that has the nomenclature DRN 80M4 slash BE1 HF slash FM slash TH slash AS7W. Now that may seem like SEW gibberish to you, and if you don't understand how our nomenclature works, I'm sure it does. You can figure out a lot of this by looking at our catalogs, but let me just explain what that tells me. It tells me which model of motor I have, DRN 80M4, that specifies its type and size. The BE1HF means there is an electromechanical break of a certain size. FM simply indicates the kind of flange on the motor. TH means it has a certain type of temperature sensor and AS7W means it has an encoder. In this case, it's an absolute encoder with an SEW EuroDrive interface that is similar to the industry standard hyperface. All right, I'm going to need to supply that information during startup. I also happen to know that I am operating on a 460 to 480 volt power supply coming out the wall and I have a motor that is currently wired to operate on 460 volts three phase. I need to know this information during startup. Now, let me mention something else before we go on, and that is the concept of the electronic nameplate. Motors with encoders may include this feature. It's kind of like almost an ancestor to DDI, that plug and play sort of motor technology that SCW has recently introduced. An electronic nameplate lives in the encoder and it communicates over the encoder cable and it provides the basic motor parameters directly to the VFD. So instead of your typing them in by hand, the VFD can just read them directly and it saves you a lot of time at startup, also prevents you from making mistakes. 
Now, I don't know what your motor has, if it has one or not, but we're going to act as though it doesn't, whether it does or not. So we're going to key in the nameplate manually because I want you to understand how to do that. All right, enough talk. Let's move on and configure our motor. I'm going to pick drivetrain one. SCW gives you two drivetrains. This allows you just to have two alternative configurations set up. You can switch between them. Obviously, you can't use them at the same time, but they are available. Normally, you're just going to use drivetrain one because most people, unless they're doing a special configuration or they have two motors with a selector switch, aren't going to use both drivetrains. So I picked drivetrain one and it's asking me to enter the motor nameplate. Now, if I had an electronic nameplate, it would be read at this point automatically and it would display, but my motor doesn't happen to have one. But if yours does, of course, what you would do is you would ignore it and you would just key in the manual information. So I'm going to click in here and I'm going to type in my motor's nomenclature. And my instructions tell me if you have a temperature sensor, which has the nomenclature TH or TF, don't enter it in. The reason we do this is many of our demo units don't have the temperature sensors wired up. And if you tell MoviDrive technology that there's a temperature sensor and it can't find it, it's going to keep throwing up a fault. So we just don't enter the nomenclature. Also, I'll just give you a clue. You don't have to key in the full nomenclature, things about the flange and the hand release. Just give the basic information about the motor, the brake, and the encoder. And of course, if you were doing this for real, in a real application, you would include temperature sensors. Let me type this in now. All right, so I've identified my motor, my brake, and my encoder. I now click Apply Drivetrain. Okay, now at this point, I need to provide some specific information. For example, the frequency of my motor. European motors run at 50 hertz, American motors run at 60. I'm in the United States, so I'm going to pick 60, which is what my motor does. I also need to pick the voltage configuration. Now my particular motor has been wired to operate either on 230 or 460, and it's in the 460 configuration right now. So I better find that option on my list here. And it is right here, so 230 to 460. And then I check a few other things. Now, since I don't have a temperature sensor, I'm going to let the VFD use what's called thermal protection model, where it kind of guesses about the temperature. It's got my brake here, and my brake is connected up to the DB00 connector, so everything is pretty much now okay. So now I click continue with two, and it asks me some encoder questions. Now I'm not going to be using the encoder for this, and I don't have to make any setting changes anyway. The defaults are fine, so I'll click continue with three. And then finally, a few more decisions. I have to pick my motor control algorithm. An asynchronous motor has three choices. If it's got an encoder, VF, VFC+, and CFC, if it doesn't have an encoder, it won't have CFC, but I do, so I have all three of those. Now, VFC Plus is a very good choice for an asynchronous motor because it works either open or closed loop, but I'm not going to use it. I'm actually going to pick the dumbest motor control mode, which is plain old VF. This is the generic one that all VFDs support. We won't be using this for any other labs, but I want to show you this because you can use this with practically any motor on the planet that's compatible with the VFD. So I pick that. I also want to change my pulse width modulation, PWM frequency. I have pretty sensitive ears. I can hear the lower frequencies and it's rather painful. So I'm going to pick 16 kilohertz instead. That puts it above the range of human hearing. If you've got a dog or a cat nearby, you might want to usher them somewhere else because they can still hear it and it will bother them. Higher frequencies are quieter, and that is often better, especially in an environment where you want things to be quiet. Of course, in a factory, it doesn't matter as much, but do be aware your VFD will run hotter at the higher frequency. But again, this is a lab, so we're not really loading our motor. The last thing I have to do is key in my nominal line voltage, and it defaults to 400, which is common in Europe, but in the US, 460 or 480 is much more common. 
So I key 460 in. And finally, I click Continue and Transfer Drivetrain to Device. And it says, do I want to go into Startup State? OK, it's going to go and do a commissioning now. So I need to make sure, is everything safe? Because I don't want something weird to happen during startup. Yes, it is. Everything's fine. So I click Yes. And that is it. We've now gone through the startup state and our motor is configured and we could run it at this point. But we need to do one other thing first. I want to set some limits just so my drive will operate safely. To do this, I go to the monitoring functions menu and I pick the limit values submenu. This sets what's called the application limit, the maximum positive and negative motor speed, in other words, clockwise and counterclockwise. I can set my acceleration and deceleration. I can set my emergency stop values. There are a lot of things to set. When we go into future labs, I'm going to explain these in greater detail. But right now, I just want to limit my motor speed and set its acceleration and deceleration. Now notice it defaulted up here to 36,000 RPM. That is completely impossible with the motor I've got connected up. 1800 RPM is its nominal speed. So I'm going to double click this and type in 1800 and I'll hit enter. With SCW software, you must hit enter. You can't tab out of fields or they revert back to the previous value. So I'm just going to hit enter here to accept it. I need to change the rotation in the other direction also to 1800. If I had a European motor, I'd probably use 1500 rather than 1800 because that's their nominal speed. You should use, of course, whatever your motor is rated at. Now we need to set acceleration and deceleration. This is how fast it speeds up and slows down. This, of course, is application dependent, but I'm going to pick a value that just gives me a quarter second acceleration and deceleration, which is 7,200 revolutions per minute per second. And I'm going to use that for both acceleration and deceleration. Now we're going to do a lab on ramp values and acceleration deceleration down the road. You'll understand this better then. For now, just key it in and trust the values. Okay, well that's everything we need now to run our motor safely. So we can back up to our access circle and get ready to pop into manual mode and try things out. At this point, I don't have any faults. I just have a zero one code, which means that I'm just in control or inhibit, which is fine. I should be in control or inhibit during commissioning, that's safe. But you might have a fault. You might see a red lightning bolt there. And if you do, click on it, pop up the dialog box and reset it. If you can't clear it, then you probably have a wiring problem. Also, if you get a data set different message, that little not equal symbol in a yellow triangle, then you'll need to click the device to PC button to synchronize things. That doesn't happen all the time. In my case, it didn't, but I did put it in the instructions just to be safe. So now I'm ready for manual mode. I'm going to click the tools quadrant here to pop out the choices, and I'm going to pick manual mode. And this opens the manual mode tool on the right side of the screen. It's deactivated right now, so the first thing I need to do is click activate. And it says, OK, I can't run the motor because the output stage is inhibited. Digital input DI00 is not in the right state. With SEW products, DI00 is permanently committed to control or inhibit. You can't reassign it to anything else. I need to turn that switch on on my control box or I can't run my motor. I'm going to do that. But before I flip it, let me just call your attention to the fact that in the access circle, there is now a little tiny hand symbol next to the status code. That means we're in manual mode. And it also appears up here at the top of the screen next to the code. All right, so all of that makes sense. Let me go flip that switch and we're going to then run the motor. You notice as soon as I flip that switch, the code changed from 01 control or inhibit to 04. That means it's in manual mode and ready to run. So we're going to go ahead and start our drive running. Now we're in the most basic control mode here, which is good for testing. It is what's called just basic speed control. We have a simple speed control that we can activate and some buttons to run the drive. Let's start with that just to make sure everything works. First thing I'm going to do is click the play button. 
and my motor is activated. I'm now going to give it some speed by turning the little speed slider here. And my drive is now running at about 500 RPM. And you can see it's spinning there on the camera. If I want to go the other way, I can just reverse direction here. I can make it go a little faster. In reverse direction, I can also reverse direction by pressing the plus minus speed reversal and make it go back and forth. Notice these also have keyboard shortcuts. I can use F7 to control that. I can stop my drive by clicking F4. I can restart it by clicking F5 or just doing it with a mouse. And I can key in actual speeds. If I just double click here and type in like 750 RPM and hit enter, I can go to a specific speed. If I want to reverse direction, I'll put a minus sign in there. That's another way to operate it. So my motor operates fine. So clearly I've got my basic setup correct. Everything's running well. All right, so that's some of the basic features of manual mode. Let me show you a few other things as well. If you click the little gear symbol here, you can adjust some things like acceleration and deceleration. If you go up here and pop this menu down, right now there's nothing else here because we have our motor configured in VF mode, which can't do much but run in speed control. But if you have an encoder and you select one of the more advanced modes, there will be other manual mode options like positioning and so forth, and we will use those in the future. There are some other features available. We'll be exploring them as you go along. Manual mode is actually very powerful. All right, but we are done now, so we're going to go ahead and just make sure we've stopped. We'll click our stop button, and our drive is definitely stopped. The next thing we need to do is deactivate manual mode. What I like to do before I deactivate manual mode is inhibit the drive just as a safety feature. So I'm going to go and flip my DI00 switch off, and then I'm going to deactivate. You notice once again, it warns me my output stage is inhibited. I'm now going to deactivate manual mode. It says, do I really want to? And be aware the drive could start. Well, I've inhibited it to prevent that. So I feel good about clicking yes. And I'm now out of manual mode and I can close this window up to free up space if I want. Let me give you one little final warning. Never leave a drive in manual mode. If it's in manual mode and you haven't deactivated it, it will stay in manual mode until you come back in and deactivate it. All right, so don't forget that. Be sure to deactivate, which I have. I've deactivated it and I've just closed it. And there it's now gone. The little hand has disappeared. And that means my drive is free to do normal things. The last thing I'm going to do is save my project by clicking the little floppy disk symbol. Notice it's got a yellow dot. That means changes have happened to the project. I'll click it, the dot goes away, everything's good. And so that is the end of our first lab, a basic motor startup, and we've confirmed that it works by using manual mode. That's a really good place to begin. And that is the end of session number eight. Hope you enjoyed it. In session number nine, we're going to look into what's called terminal control mode, which is actually a very practical way to run the VFD for real world applications. So we're getting practical pretty fast. See you then.